let me start going. Uh, hello, this is Dr. Griffin. I'm actually local here, right? Columbia. So uh, apparently where it's easier to get drugs than personal protective equipment. I'm going to break my talk down into three parts. Um, the first part will just kind of march through because I want to get to really the meat of it, which is the center, um, which is really the clinical experiences. So the first part, I'm going to go through a little bit about um, our involvement in actually rolling out testing, testing capacity in the area. So just to give people a little bit of a sense, it's not that long ago that it was December, right? So January, February, March, April, only about four months ago um, when we first really started hearing um, about the cases in China. Um, first case in the U.S. was in January, and that was the travel up into Washington State. Initially, uh, they were telling us, or at least the thought was, this was uh, due to animal to human spread in a seafood market. So initially there wasn't clear indication of person to person and a lot of folks were telling us not to worry. Um, so just to give you on the map, right, relative, it's, this all started a little bit north of uh, Guangdong up here in Wuhan. And what happened in China? So a lot of this stuff you can, interesting enough, you can get from the media and some of the the actual academic journals, which now become the New York Times and CNN and some of the other ones. Um, but let's, let's jump to the United States. And so let's jump particularly to New York. And, and I like to talk about when the world, or at least, well, some of us started to wake up, and this being um, near the end of January. I was actually off lecturing in um, Scotland. I was there for Burns Night, which maybe not a lot of people know about, but the Chinese Lunar New Year. Um, was sort of a critical moment. So this is here just where things stood the day before the Chinese New Year started. Um, the confirmed cases being reported out of China, I'm not sure how accurate this data is, but at least this was the data being disseminated, um, was a little over a thousand confirmed cases, about 41 deaths. People are still trying to decide if this was going to be something to worry about. Um, as mentioned, we had already had our first traveler, but at this point people were saying, uh, January 20th, we have a traveler come in, we're not that concerned. But then it was the Chinese Lunar New Year, which I think got a lot of us concerned, saying that, boy, if there are you know, anywhere near the number of cases that are being reported or even suspected, and now you have the amount of travel that usually occurs during the Chinese Lunar New Year, this is potentially going to be a little bit disastrous, to put it mildly. Um, this is a couple days later, I'll say, um, February 2nd, when people are starting to get concerned that travel restrictions to and from China go into effect. And then 2-4 is when the FDA steps in with what was at the time hoped to be a helpful, a stringently written emergency use authorization, which was going to somehow help us in some way with uh, getting a lot of testing done. Um, but as we actually saw, this, this was a bit of a hindrance. Um, as we went through February, the CDC approach was that um, for all the tests being run by any public health lab, they needed to be rerun by the CDC. Um, unfortunately, and when we saw the numbers by the end of February, um, this amounted to fewer than 100 samples a day, about 83 per day being successfully processed throughout the entire United States. Um, this is about a time when I was actually, well, still serving, but serving as the um, chief of infectious disease for pro healthcare associates here in New York, one of my other hats. And we were struggling as we saw what we thought was community spread in the New York area. Um, we actually had one particular patient who's now quite famous, the pro health Westchester patient who actually ended up eventually in the ICU at uh, Columbia Presbyterian. Um, and in late February, we were already concerned when this patient was sent to the hospital that he may actually have COVID-19 and that he may actually have it from the community. Um, unfortunately, what we were running into was a, a check box issue. He had no known contact. He had not traveled. And therefore, sort of a circular thinking from the CDC, he could not be tested because even though community spread had just been documented in California, um, this man had not met their criteria for testing. It was actually February 29th um, when New York actually gets the ability to test when this man is finally tested and then we see for the first time that yes, there is apparently community spread in New York, in the New York area. Um, the estimates actually going back is that we probably had about 10,000 active cases by the time we were finally able to confirm our first patient was positive. 
what was going on with testing at that point? So now we're in March, March 1st, we document that there is community spread in New York City. Um, but now again, a bit of circular thinking, we can only test contacts of this man, um, even though he obviously got it somewhere. Um, so we're only testing in Westchester. And again, we're only testing people who he's been in contact with. So we initially have this cluster in Westchester, unable to do much testing beyond that. Um, some of the local hospitals start testing. The big healthcare system in the Long Island area, Northwell, on about the 8th of March, starts rolling out testing. Finally, it's the 16th of March when we start having commercial labs giving us the opportunity to test. And very quickly, um, ProHealth um, Care Associates, the New York Department of Health, start documenting pretty significant community spread. Um, Quest jumps in and helps with this. And actually, four days later, enough of um, the cases have been documented as positive that Governor Cuomo announces his first pause order. Okay. All right. So that was the timeline. So now we know it's here. And we're, as everyone is well aware, seeing tremendous number of cases. So let's talk a little bit about what we're actually seeing. So this is, in addition to my different roles. One of the things I do is I actually see a tremendous number of patients every day. So a lot of times you see stuff in the literature and it's very hard in the literature to really to get out to communicate what we're actually seeing. So let me let me share with you my, you know, in the trench experiences. Um, so what about the clinical presentation? Um, initially, it was very strict, right? You had to have a fever, you had to have a cough, you had to have trouble breathing. Um, but actually, we're seeing a much broader range. And I think the the quote of a really bright ICU doc I was working with, basically when we talked, she said, you know what? This is a viral illness and it presents like a viral illness. And that's completely true. Um, they may come in with general malaise. They may have fever or not. I think if people were watching the numbers from uh, Columbia earlier, about a quarter of them actually do not even have fever when they present. Um, about a quarter of them do not even have cough when they initially present. We see difficulty breathing, chills, rigors, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, um, this loss of taste um, or smell. Apparently, initially, I thought, well, of course, I've had a cold. We haven't we all? Isn't that common? This seems to be actually something slightly different and is not always associated with a significant amount of congestion. Still trying to understand the mechanism behind this. Um, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Initially, in the reports out of China, right, we didn't see much in terms of gastrointestinal presentation. Uh, it was only 5 6% is what came out of the initial studies. Um, but what we found is if you ask the patients, the majority of them will actually report some gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, usually, basically, I'm having trouble breathing. That's the least of my problems. This is not a profuse watery diarrhea, but more of a loose, um, frequent bowel movements. The clinical course is super, super helpful for us as clinicians. The first week actually is usually a typical viral illness with the range. Um, it's the second week when we see the respiratory difficulties, signs of hypoxemia, we actually see falls sometimes. The third week, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this, if we can get there in time. This is when we see a lot of coagulation issues. We see um, venous, we see arterial, we see strokes, we see digit ischemia. So what are the complications? And this is really our challenge, right? Initially we think, oh, it's a viral syndrome. We've got to target the viral syndrome, get rid of this virus. Um, but the interesting issue is most of the complications we're seeing is when the virus actually starts to wane. We're seeing this during the second week when the virus is going down and we seem to be seeing initially respiratory um, decompensation. This can be mild up to requiring mechanical ventilation we actually see a significant amount of cardiovascular complications. Um, renal, I think people will see the numbers, we'll hit this quickly if we can. Um, but if you end up on dialysis, single digit survival rates for most centers. Um, the gastrointestinal can be diarrhea, but it also can be perforations. Um, neurological is getting more attention from everyone, including us. Um, this can range from basically balance disturbances to some pretty significant neurological complications, particularly what looks like a doubling of the number of stroke cases that we're seeing present to the emergency departments. Frightening here is that this tends to be in younger individuals. Um, but there's also a whole dermatological array of things from rashes to weird fizzling sensation to COVID toes. 
Um, some of this, we're not quite sure. It might be immunological, but we're also seeing vasculitis and ischemia. So how are people doing, right? I just wanna give people context before we go into some specifics. The outcomes have not been so great. Um, if you end up on a ventilator, um, in a couple of the studies, we're talking about 18% of people being discharged alive. We're hoping the Columbia Presbyterian numbers are a bit better when they come out. We're hoping that's closer to 50%. Um, but when you see these studies of the people being um, admitted, a lot of them are still in the hospital when these studies come out. Um, so here we see about 66% of people discharged alive out of New York Hospital. Um, Here's some numbers out of NYU, really pretty horrible at the time of publication, only 3.5% of their ventilated patients have been discharged alive, and um, about half the patients were still in the hospital. Uh, maybe the worst outcomes in the region were published by Northwell. Um, a lot of, I think, might be a timing issue here because most of these patients are still in the hospital. So when we see a 3.3% of their ventilated patients being discharged alive, most patients are still in the hospital. So um, time will tell if um, these folks uh, get out, if they survive, if the outcomes are as bad as it looked in the JAMA publication. But let's hit three things. So one of the big things that, that we're concerned about that we think may be driving um, this, and this is actually, this one is under review, but so you get to see it first. Um, this is looking at a lot of, um, um, the issues with this proposed cytokine storm. And we're trying to draw a contrast between the flavor of this cytokine storm and that that we saw in SARS and MERS, um, where, we see, where we saw elevations of IL-8, we saw um, really significant interferon gamma responses. Um, the cytokine storm here, at least what we're seeing, is more of an IL-6 driven. And this is driving a lot of people to look at trying to treat these patients with um, interleukin-6 receptor inhibitors. There's also been quite a bit of steroids being used. Um, still waiting for controlled studies to help guide us here, um, but some of the preliminary stuff looks like it may be beneficial. Um, again, this is a very tough time to practice medicine without well-controlled clinical trials guiding us. Um, the next, I mentioned the um, thromboembolic issue. So we see a lot of venous. Um, this is actually um, in press, so this will come out um, hopefully soon. But um, we didn't realize this going in. We very quickly learned um, that a lot of individuals come in. They have their acute respiratory issue. We feel like they're getting better. Then suddenly things go wrong. Um, initially, we saw D-dimer as a uh, risk stratification um, issue. And now we're realizing actually that may be a marker of um, coagulation issues, seeing a significant number of really significant pulmonary emboli as cause of death. And also the arterial side, it's a little bit um, troubling, I'll say. Um, this is, we're seeing strokes, but we're also seeing limb and digit ischemia. Um, and sometimes when you actually pull out these um, clots, do, do a thrombectomy, you're actually seeing these white, fresh, really look to be platelet-rich clots. Um, so now we're trying to figure out, do we just um, work on the coagulation um, cascade, or are we also looking at targeting um, the platelets? Uh, maybe antiplatelet agents can play a role here. So big complications, a whole list. What do we do about this? So there are a number of um, big trials, and actually I'll finish with my last slide, hopefully coming in on time here. Um, hydroxychloroquine, right? This went from people threatening to drive their truck through the building so that their loved one could get hydroxychloroquine um, to now people threatening to drive their truck through the side of the building so that their patient does, their loved one does not get hydroxychloroquine. Um, so I think there's getting more and more consensus on, we don't think hydroxychloroquine is playing a very positive role during that second week um, when patients uh, are one in minute, the ICU, Dr. Griffin. when they're quite sick. Um, but there's still the whole question of, does it play a role during that first week? So there's a number of, we call prevention and treatment of COVID-19 with hydroxychloroquine studies. Um, we're doing um, a large one at UPenn, looking at all these issues. We're doing a um, couple in the New York area, patch two and three, looking at early treatment of patients during the first week, and also healthcare worker prevention, patch two and three. And patch four, we are looking at uh, first responders. So hopefully, we're actually going to get some information here. Hopefully, we're going to have some good clinical data um, to sort out how do we treat these folks. And so on that note, um, thank you for that really quick run through. Uh, thank you, Dr. Griffin. And um, do
do we have any uh, questions from the attendees or the panelists? Um, if so, please raise your hand. Um, and if not, I, I actually we have a question um, from Neville Kleins. Or we had a question from Neville Klein. It seems <laughs> to have disappeared. Um, let me see here. I, um, can you hear me? Is this Neville? Yes, this is Neville. Hi. Yes, we can hear you. I was wondering if you just comment quickly on the quantifieron results that were there. Yeah, I uh, sort of quickly buzzed through those, but it was interesting. We we initially did the quantifieron testing. Um, because there was this whole concern, oh, if you're going to be giving people the, the IL-6 receptor inhibitor, um, we probably want to do TB testing because, you know, maybe we're putting people at risk of um, latent tuberculosis relapse. And actually, it was quite, um, quite impressive. I still remember the call from um, the chief of the hospital saying, should we even keep doing these? Because they're all coming up indeterminate. It was really interesting. Um, the patients who are quite ill, um, would end up with basically in sort of the bottom of the slide, which I put back up, you're not seeing a mitogen response, right? And this is a way of testing the interferon gamma response. We usually think of memory T cells. And across the board, um, the people who are quite ill ended up having no mitogen response. We did notice that the people that, that did well, the people who ended up not requiring um, ICU admission, um, who had low levels of IL-6 did not seem to have this cytokine storm. Um, they, interesting enough, actually had a good mitogen response. So um, this was sort of a you know a very interesting um, observation. I'll say that we we came across. And um, we have a question from Ira Sutton. Ira, are you there? Um, if not, uh, we have a question from Cynthia Lang. Cynthia, can you hear me? Uh, you may. <coughs> Cynthia? No. Well, we'll try Saul Silverstein. Good morning, Daniel. It's, oh, Saul. There's a lot of rumor and innuendo about the use of Pepsi as um, the treatment for this disease because it supposedly has some interaction with the proteus. Do you know uh, anything about what's going on with these huge doses of IV treatment? Yeah, you know, it's been like the Wild West, I have to admit, in the last month. Suddenly, um, the paradigm of medicine, which was do no harm and avoid giving treatments to um, people until we actually have proven benefit, um, seems to have been forgotten. People are slowly being reminded of it again. Um, but there actually are trials, and there's a big um, trial right here in this area where they're giving people um, high dose um, um, Pepsid, basically, um, um, and uh, trying to see if it has any effect. It's really, it's really kind of a challenge because a lot of these treatments are being thrown out there into these clinical trials without sort of the, I guess, to be honest, the forethought and um, the preliminary data that we would usually like to bring before we start enrolling people into clinical trials. So yeah, there's, there's a bit of ideas, um, discussion about this, and there actually are some, some trials um, looking at whether or not this is a benefit. 